good evening and welcome to each of you. Our first song tonight will be number 54. Number 54. is going to sing.
thank you for that special end song. Number 38 is our next song together. 38. First note, please. One so aimlessly I wandered round the tangled paths of sin. All about me seemed so hopeless, doubts and fears without within. Then a voice of kindly gentle spoke sweet peace unto my soul. Gone my days of sin and wandering since the Savior made me whole. I have never lost the wonder of it all. I have never lost the wonder of it all. Since the day that Jesus saved me and a whole new life he gave me, I have never lost the wonder of it all. Now my life is in there. 122 is our next song together. 122. <clears throat>
Number 146 is our next song together. If you're able, we invite you to stand while we sing 146. There's a great day coming, a great day coming, there's a great day coming by and by, when the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left. Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment? For this prayer, I'd like to ask Brother Rob Miller if he'll lead us, please. Father, thank you for the time we have to gather in your house tonight. We pray for your spirit's leadership in each of our hearts and minds that we would come to the uh, truths and the realities that you would have us to understand and grasp tonight. Be with the needs of your people. We pray especially for uh, Dolores and her injury that you might give her speedy healing. We also pray for Audrey, that you might be with her and her needs at this time, too. Please uh, uh, lead and direct through the service and guide us through the week ahead as we carry your coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
I don't know about you, but I love our piano. I guess you have to give some credit to those that play it, but it uh, puts out a lot of beautiful music. We appreciate all that contribute. Well, we have some things uh, coming out of ladies' meeting. First of all, I'll mention that we didn't know of this this morning, but Audrey is in the hospital. I don't know what hospital, but uh, keep her in your prayer, if you will. And they're going to run some more tests on her, not for sure, uh, everything that's going on. So uh, keep her in your prayer. Well, um, from the ladies' group, February 17th, which is a Friday. I mentioned that this morning. I had a little bit of a heads up on it. But there's going to be <clears throat> a combination here at the church basement, a couple's night and a kid's night. I don't know what you identify with. But uh, this will be at 7 o'clock in the 17th of February. And all you do is bring, bring a drink to share because desserts and snacks are being provided. So that sounds pretty nice. And it's going to be a fun night of fellowship with your spouse and other couples. So my spouse will be enough. But anyway, other couples. So you and your spouse and other spouses and their wife and husband and whatever. But anyway, the point is, sign up on the bulletin board if you plan on coming. So there is a sign-up sheet. And then uh, the same night is a kid's night. That'll be here, too, at 7 o'clock. There'll be a Bible lesson, an activity, and snacks provided, and a Valentine exchange. And also, please sign up on the bulletin board. But if that's not enough, there's more. And February 25th, at 10 a.m. in the morning at Bell Gardens Assisted Living, uh, ladies who want to be a part of this, they're going to bless senior ladies with a devotion and a manicure. And uh, so uh, if you have any questions, you can see Beth on that. But I think this was probably discussed uh, in detail at the ladies' meeting. So that would be February 25th. It's just a good deed being done to help those people and perhaps get a message of the Word of God into them also. So we appreciate all of the efforts being put forth. How many of you cook? All right. See a few hands. Forrest? There you go. We got it. Anyway, uh, I do have a point in that. Probably some of you cook by memory. You um, have been at it long enough. You don't need to look at a piece of paper. But occasionally there'll be something come out and you've never cooked it before. It'll be a recipe. And in that recipe will be a lot of different ingredients. And if you were to just take one of those ingredients by itself, it might be rather sickening. You know, you may not be able to swallow it. But you put them all together, you mix them all together, and they will make a good um, dish, whatever it is that you're cooking. And I, my point is, there's a lot of things like that in the preaching. Um, there are some things that a person may not necessarily like the taste of it, but it's a part of the overall picture. And uh, <clears throat> so help us out with your prayers because we strive to get God's leadership in every message that we bring. And uh, we sit down with him, with God in the word, and pray and just let it come as uh, it unfolds to us in our study. And so I'm uh, persuaded that sometimes there's something in the message that a person may not exactly like that, but yet it's a part of the overall picture. Tonight we're preaching on your savings account in heaven. And keep that in mind. Uh, because everything that we're going to say tonight is to kind of alert you and more get your mind running in that direction about laying up treasure in heaven. And it's for you. It's not for me. I don't get any of your rewards. And you're not going to get any of mine either. So this is an individual thing. But we hope to, by the things that we would say, to kind of stir our thinking up a little deeper about this uh, because it's easy to not really think that much about it. And yet, <clears throat> that's one of the things that Christ said we had, have to do. And he tells us to do it, to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. 
So I want to read in Matthew 24, if I didn't direct you there already. In Matthew chapter 24, and we'll begin reading in verse 1, Matthew 24, 1. It says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. <clears throat> then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I was going to spend some time in this chapter, but I think uh, due to uh, the amount of time we have, I'm not going to get into uh, what is all covered in the chapter. The chapter covers our present age and the gospel being preached in all the world, as you see in verse 14, and then the end coming, the end of the Gentile age. Not the end of the world, but the end of this period in which the church is on the earth and preaching the gospel. And then, of course, following that will be the great tribulation, then Christ coming back to set up his kingdom at, with the battle of Armageddon, and then the millennial kingdom. But um, what I want to... Um, <clears throat> I w let's go to Second Peter, the third chapter. We will uh, check in with this one. In 2 Peter chapter 3, as you think about, we're, we're, we're not going to uh, uh, be in our present state forever. We're going to be glorified at the rapture. And then, of course, everything we've done will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ to determine our rewards in heaven. But I want to read in uh, verse 10 of 2 Peter chapter 3. It says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And that, of course, is going to be after the millennial reign. And there will be a new heavens and a new earth, as you see in Revelation chapter 21. But here is the point in verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? So that is our first question. It's, uh, we have several questions along that line, but it's a question to provoke your thought about you, your thoughts about you in eternity. Not sitting on the pew tonight, comfortable and uh, perhaps you know, not too concerned about these things, but at that point in eternity is what we need to address. And you're an intelligent person tonight. You must not ignore reality. I know that's one of the things that helped me a lot because you've heard me talk a number of times about how that I wasn't really interested in going to church I wasn't really interested in being identified as a Christian because I had seen people made fun of who were Christians, and <clears throat> I didn't want that. But what got a hold of my thinking was reality. The reality was Jesus is going to come. And when he comes, if I'm not saved, I'm going to be left behind. And I'll never have opportunity to be saved again. Just that reality was enough to jar me out 
of that limbo I was in. So truth will do that for us, but we must not ignore it. We must not just dismiss it and uh, just get rid of it as soon as we can. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and there in verse 9. <coughs> It says, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all, and this is talking about saved people, the judgment seat of the saved, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. So we can become so earthbound in our thinking and in our interest to where that we only think if we're saved about, well, I know where I'm going when I die. I'm going to heaven. Rather than what is the reality going to be when I get there? The reality of the judgment seat of Christ, the reality of the evaluation of my whole life. In uh, 1 Corinthians, now there will be no punishment for saved people in heaven, but it's going to be a difference between rewards and loss of rewards. So back in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and there in verse 11, it says, For other foundation... Can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We preach Wednesday night on the, the rock upon which Christ built his church, not being Peter. Well, here's another verse that the only foundation there is, is Jesus Christ. So he is that rock. But anyway, verse 12. If any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. That's the reality of the judgment seat of Christ. <clears throat> now, let's try to connect with that. Let's say you've spent years and years building up your home, building your house, getting it nice, landscaping, furniture, everything like you want it, and some nights you go home and it's been all burned to the ground and you don't have any insurance to cover it. In other words, it's a total loss. Is that going to mean anything to you? Yeah, you're there, you're alive, everything's fine with you, but you've lost everything. Is that going to mean anything? Well, when we get to heaven, that's the way it's going to be. Is it going to mean anything to us when we see that our life is just nothing? It's been all burned up? It doesn't count for anything? Well, certainly it will. <clears throat> I know years ago when... Uh, it was a couple years after we were here, maybe longer than that, but we discovered termites in the church, and they were active. So we had a company come down from Dayton, and they treated the building. And by the way, if you happen to notice in the floor downstairs, there's little holes drilled around the walls in the tile. And uh, so they did a real good job in treating for termites, and we don't have any termites anymore. But the foreman on the job, he and I were, were talking about the Lord. He said, well, <clears throat> I was a member of a Baptist church, but he said they excluded me. I said, oh, yeah? And so he began to tell me some of his uh, theories. And one of the things he said, amongst other things, which I knew why the church was very, very right on track when they dropped his name. He said, I don't believe in laying up rewards in heaven. Because I'm not a selfish guy. And so he said, uh, that would just be selfish on my part if I was laying up rewards in heaven. So he said, I don't want to be a selfish guy. I thought, well, you certainly don't belong in a New Testament church with that kind of thinking. But 
We may think that's absurd, but I wonder, are we having any deeper thoughts about laying up rewards in heaven than perhaps what this guy did? Uh, he was very open about it. Now, <clears throat> with uh, let's say you also invest everything you own into some venture. And, of course, you always... Uh, uh, you know, get something through the mail. This is coming up. This is going to be worth a lot of money. And so here's where you need to put your money. But let's say you invest all of your liquid assets, which is cash and otherwise, into a venture that you think is really going to turn out good. And then you hear it was a flop and you lost everything. Will that mean anything to you? Well, certainly it will. So what I'm pointing it out is reality. In eternity, when we lose what we could have had, it's going to mean everything to us. And 1 John 2.28 talks about being ashamed as we would meet the Lord. So um, we need to make sure about this. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17, in 1 John chapter 4 and there in verse 17, says, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. So if we really say we love the Lord, it should be about, I want to be accepted to, by him and be on good terms with him in the judgment. And so that is something about the choices that we make in life. And the choices that we make in life are really relative to how we love the Lord. And uh, if we're not making the right choices in life, it means we're not really loving the Lord like we should. And we'll really find out in a real abrupt way at the judgment seat. So what are we comprehending? Are we comprehending only the moment? If all we're comprehending is just a moment, then that's all we're living in, is just a moment. But if we are comprehending eternal matters, then we will live for eternal matters. And so what really has our attention? And I think all of us, including me and all of us, we probably need reminders to get our attention on this subject more and more, to where that when we get to heaven, will not be ashamed of our savings account. So back to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 13, it says, He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. <clears throat> That's not talking about soul salvation, because we know soul salvation is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's easy to dismiss that verse by saying, well, I'm saved, I'm not saved by works, I'm not saved by endurance, so therefore I'm fine. But that's not the subject the Lord was dealing with. The question is, are you saving yourself or are you losing everything about yourself? That's a question for us. So we're talking about what are we saving for eternity of this life? What are kind of a, a reward are we making in eternity with this life? And Luke chapter 9 talks about if we're wanting to save our life, we're going to lose it. But if we'll lose our life for Christ's sake, we will save it. So how much of our life are we actually investing in eternal riches? Now, this is between you and God, and I want you to keep that in mind. Uh, you don't answer to me for that, and I don't answer to you, but we answer to God. And the whole point is when we get to heaven, that's when it's really going to matter to us. But let's put a little wisdom in the picture here. The devil does his best to turn everything upside down in our minds and make spiritual truth and spiritual opportunity to be offensive. He wants it to turn into something offensive. So if you um, talk to somebody about the Lord, about being saved, you know what the devil wants to do? He wants to make that person mad at you. He wants to make that person shun you from that point on. Well, <clears throat> John 3.16 says, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So what did the devil do with that? 
Well, the Son came down to earth to take the place of sinners on Calvary. The devil turned everything upside down, and they hated him. They hated him. So I am persuaded that anything that is preached from the pulpit that is God's word, the devil will do his best to make the message to be offensive in the thinking of people. I have seen that. And I'm sure anyone that's been in church very long realizes that, uh, okay, here we go again. The preacher is going to get on my case. He's going to rake me over the coals and this, that, and the other. That's the devil taking the message that is intended for the good of a person and turning it upside down. Turning it upside down. But the whole point is, what are you building up in heaven? That's the whole point. The point that when you get there, you'll be glad. You'll be happy. Or will you be ashamed? Faithfulness always adds to our account, but the lack of faithfulness causes a loss to our account. Now, I think everybody should consider that if you build a house and then you take a bulldozer and bulldoze it down, you don't have a house. So if you serve God and then you quit serving God, you're tearing down everything you did. And that's when you start, like Second John chapter or verse eight says, that we want to make sure we don't lose that which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. And then another thing about a savings account. I'm not going to ask you how many have a savings account, but in Matthew chapter six and verse nineteen, in Matthew chapter six and verse nineteen. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If I was to ask uh, about you having a savings account, and if you have one, it's going to be a pleasant subject for you. You know, that'll sort of maybe bring a smile to your face. If you happen to have one, you'll reflect on that. Yeah, that's a good thing. It is a good thing. And I would advise you to uh, have a little something because we're in times in which things could change quickly. And uh, I'm not your financial advisor but they say a person should have enough to where they can get by six months if things really go bad. So just a word to the wives, just passing that on. That's something I've heard. And uh, <clears throat> just this uh, thing living from paycheck to paycheck, that can get kind of tough in a tough situation. But if you have a savings account and you know what you did to build it up, you know also what you didn't do Ten, that enabled you to build it up. And so it has the positive and the negative. It takes both. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7 through 9 talks about sowing and reaping. And that we reap what we sow. So when it comes to this matter, he says, if you sow to the flesh, you'll reap of the flesh. But if you sow to the spirit, why well, you'll reap of the spirit everlasting life along with that. Only a spiritual harvest lays up anything for us in heaven. I don't care how we, good we get it here on earth. Um, how many things that really turn out good for us here on earth, none of that is going to lay up anything in heaven. Only that which is sown to the Spirit is going to lay up any treasure in heaven. It's possible to have a good job, make good money, spend it all, and not have a savings account. The book of Ecclesiastes deals with that in spiritual terms of how that a person can get everything that they want in this life, they can enjoy everything they want in this life, and yet it all come down to vanity and vexation of spirit. And they can't take anything with them because it's all left behind. So the conclusion of the whole matter is in Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter, in verse 13 and 14, fear God, keep his commandments, 
This is a whole duty of man because God's going to bring everybody into judgment for the lives that we have lived. How do we comprehend that? Well, we uh, looked at Corinthians this morning about how that uh, offenses arise and people take things wrong. I want to go to Corinthians again, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, this fits in with maybe wanting to get things good here on this earth, but not thinking about how they're going to play out in, in eternity. Here in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 29, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it. For the fashion of this world passeth away. If you read the entire chapter, what was going on in Corinth, they were experiencing financial problems in a general way. As you notice in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 7, I suppose therefore that it is good for the present distress... So finances were short. People were wanting to get married, but they didn't have the money to start a home. And, of course, you've heard the old saying, two can live as cheap as one. No, you can't. You can't do that. Uh, that's just a myth. Uh, but uh, the idea that they were uh, asking Paul about this, and if you read the whole chapter, you'll find that he is recommending that they take a very close look at it in terms that if they were having hard times and they're single yet, then that's their best chances of dealing with their situation financially. But if they start a home, that's going to complicate the matter. And uh, how that it may, may become a distraction for them from serving God. So he's cautioned them. He didn't tell them not to get married. He didn't tell them to get married. He just cautioned them to not let their decisions compromise anything spiritual. No spiritual uh, compromises should be allowed to enter in because there could be so many distractions in dealing with hard times, and it might even put a strain on their marriage. And, of course, sometimes it does that. So he's telling them it would be a mistake to trade off that which has eternal recompense for that which is going to shortly go away because he said there's it's going to be it'll be just like you weren't married when you get to heaven that's not going to be the situation anymore it's going to be on a different level so here's what the devil would do with that he would want them to think paul is mean-spirited because he says or he around about the way is saying we should not get married so he's mean-spirited. Well, once they got to heaven, they would find out he wasn't mean-spirited, that he was just giving them good advice for their spiritual welfare, for when they would get to heaven, they would have not compromised spiritual, eternal things just for to meet it here on earth, which would all pass away. Now, there's a lot of personal matters that can war against the truth in our minds if we're not really watching and praying. And that's what Paul was uh, warning them about. Their personal matters could war against what they should be doing spiritually and get in the way of it. So another important question for us, can we suffer exhortation? When you go to church, and <clears throat> of course uh, they don't talk too much about it anymore, but uh, people used to expect to have their toes stepped on when they went to church. You used to, maybe you've heard that expression, maybe you haven't. But uh, that the preacher is, is to step on people's toes and keep them on the alert. But in our day and time, can we suffer exhortation? And that is, can we put up with it? Can we accept it? Can we apply it and be thankful for it? And remember what we're talking about. It's all about you laying up treasure in heaven. Uh, you may not even recognize me, uh, and I may not recognize you when we get to heaven. So it's all about you laying up treasure in heaven. 
nobody can lay up treasure for you and nobody can lay up treasure for me. We have to do that on our own. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3 says that we have to set our affections on this. We have to set our affection on things above. Life is busy. Everybody's got something going on. But we must not omit this. We must bring it into our thought, am I really building up a savings account in heaven? Uh, I want to go to Hebrews chapter 11, and as we think about this being an individual matter, and um, in Hebrews chapter 11, and there in the 13th verse, these are days before there was a church, before there was any place that you could visit, that would be a, a collective body of, of people. It was just you. You and God. That's all there was. So here in Hebrews eleven thirteen, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So personal comprehension of laying up things in heaven, of claiming the promises of God with eternity's values in view, personally, not, well, the preacher says I need to do this, but you. So how is that comprehension going for you? And then in the 16th verse, <clears throat> the 16th verse, you find, but now they desire a better country. So they were looking for the heavenly country. All right? What do we desire? Now these are just questions for us. When we're thinking about you, your savings account in heaven, do you desire to lay up treasure? And then in verse, uh, 20, or verse uh, 20, 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. How do you evaluate uh, your life in terms of what you're living for? That's between you and God. But you have to come to the point where you would rather have treasure in heaven than you would just be satisfied here on earth with your life. That's between you and God. And then in verse um, 35, it says, Women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. They would rather be punished for their faith in Christ and they would get off because it would give them a reward in eternity. They had no church to rally them to do this. There was no preacher preaching to them on February 5th that they need to do this. This was between them and God all by themselves. Well, look at verse 22. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Joseph was all alone. His family sold him into slavery. His father thought he was dead. When he got down in slavery, he was lied about. He was cast into prison. Thirteen years went by. And during those thirteen years, Joseph was tried, he was true, he was triumphant because he believed in the value of waiting and serving God. So we have his story, but his journey of faithful endurance is what saved him. That's what Christ was talking about. He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. He reserved himself. He reserved himself for God. I personally know a man, he was uh, a couple years younger than I, <clears throat> I'm not going to mention his name, and it, we, uh, he went to church, he professed to be saved, he later on surrendered to preach, 
and was in the ministry as a, a assistant pastor for a number of years. But there was an instability in his life. And I know the uh, pastor commented one time because the pastor spent a lot of time with him. He said, if I could live with him every day, he said, I probably could keep him straight. He was talking about him as a teenager. But he couldn't live with him every day because he wasn't his child. Now, what I'm saying is Joseph developed his consistency as a teenager at home. And he did not want to run with the, his brothers and doing things that were wrong. He would not partake of their wicked way of life. He reserved himself for God. All right, this man that I'm talking about has spent the bulk of his adult life in prison because he did not establish consistency of being faithful and true to God and when a crisis or when a situation presented himself, he did wrong. And he really ruined his whole life, ruined his family, the whole, he's still in prison this very day. All because he did not uh, reserve himself for God. And what I'm saying, this has got to begin early. Um, we cannot ignore God with the bulk of our life and then expect at some point just to pick up on it and go with it. It's not going to work that way. We have to resolve that we're going to be faithful to the Lord and endure. Then we'll save ourselves. But if we don't, the devil's smart enough and powerful enough that if we have not established ourselves in a definite positive way with God, he can mess us up. He can mess us up big time. So once a child is old enough to be accountable to God, they can die and go to hell if they don't accept Christ as their Savior. So when it comes to children, we need to make sure that we are emphasizing to them, now is when you need to establish yourself. Now is when you need to get on board with God. Because if you don't, then this is going to be a big inconsistency in your life that you're really going to have trouble with it later on. So we have to endure. We have to endure. So what kind of a job are we doing when it comes to saving ourselves? You know, nobody can do it but you. Nobody can make your life count but you. And we certainly must not waste our opportunities, but remain true and faithful to him. I hope you're interested in laying up treasure in heaven because if you're saved tonight, when you get to heaven, that's going to be it. Uh, did I serve God faithfully or did I not serve him faithfully? Now, all the other things here on this earth are going to be gone. It's just going to be, what have I done with my life while I was here on earth for the Lord? May we bow our heads for prayer. Father, we pray that you'll help us. May this... Um, resonate with us because we know it's easy to be so distracted in this life that even going to church can be a chore and even listening uh, to the preaching may weary us, wear us out but yet we really need to be concerned about what we're doing with our opportunity in our life whether or not that when we get to heaven as a person we will be satisfied with the life that we have lived and the things that we have done for you. This is all reality, and I believe that you want us to think about these things more than we've ever thought about them before, because as the scripture says, the time is short, and we need to redeem the time because the days are evil. So bless each one here that your child with a realization of this in a new way, in a renewed way perhaps, and then if there's someone here tonight that is just not saved, that they would consider the reality of things. And if they're not doing what they need to do, that they would consider the reality of these things because they are going to play out in our life. And when they play out, they will be eternally played out. There will be no remedy, no do-overs, and no going back, but we'll be stuck with what we have done with our life. 
So we know you can bless us. We know you can enrich us. We know that you can give us that abundant life that Christ has willed for us. You're able to save us to the uttermost, and you're certainly able to bless everything that we do for you and make it worthwhile in this life and the life to come. So may your spirit give the invitation for us in Jesus' name. We offer a prayer. Let's stand while we sing. Number 130.